Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 68, La Pellegrina, Comedy for a Royal Renaissance Wedding. Last time I rounded off the story of the early Italian Renaissance theatre, which I've looked at through the life and works of playwrights. A common thread running through these playwrights, which I've discussed in the last three episodes, is that playwriting was not their only occupation. Indeed, for many, it was a sideline to academic, political or mercantile occupations. The same is true of one more playwright from the period that I would like to introduce to you, and then look in detail at the single play that he is known for, La Pellegrina, The Female Pilgrim. Girolamo Bagalgi was born in Siena in 1537, the son of a lawyer and the eldest of three sons. Little is known of his family background, but it's likely that his father worked for the Medici in some capacity. Girolamo showed literary skills early, and as a student in his hometown published a collection of sonnets that appealed for a return to the peace that Florence and Siena had enjoyed before a recent spate of rioting. The promise he showed in that work gained him very early election, aged just 20, to the city's Academia, but he soon lost his faith with that organisation and published an essay expressing his disappointment that the society was straying from the finest classical traditions. This was just when the effects of the Counter-Reformation were being felt more severely in Siena, with clerical censorship at its height. Bargalghi's mentor, the humanist Fausto Sussini, was exiled for the public acknowledgement of heretical views, and although Bargalghi was not directly implicated in the affair, he certainly felt the need to keep a low profile for a while. Giving up literature, he took to legal studies, and rapidly rose to become a lecturer on law at Siena University, before becoming a judge in Florence. After just a few years there, he returned to become a professor at Siena University. Throughout the rest of his life, he moved frequently through a succession of jobs within the legal system until his death after a short illness in 1586. Apart from some comic dialogues written in 1572, his only theatrical work was La Pellegrina. The play was written sometime between 1564 and 1568 at the request of Cardinal Fernando de' Medici as a piece suitable for a royal wedding party. Bargalghi would have been working at the university at this time and was, in fact, not the Cardinal's first choice as playwright. The Cardinal had asked Alessandro Piccolomini to fulfil the commission, but he was only recently ordained and returned to the city and was reluctant to become attached to the project. The record of the progress of the project is confused, but it seems that the Cardinal was keen for Piccolomini to be involved and it was agreed that he would supply some plotting. Bargalghi would create the dialogue, and his mentor, Fausto Sassini, still in favour at this point, would provide the jokes. Piccolomini's influence on the play is very clear, but the exact division of labour isn't known. As all three were members of the Academia at the time, it seems likely that Piccolomini suggested the collaboration to extricate himself from the project as much as possible. But why he chose Bargagli, an academic and legal practitioner with almost no theatrical experience, is not known. Whatever the reason, the play was completed and Bargagli's name alone was attached to it. The Cardinal received the play. He wrote a letter of thanks for it and then did nothing with it. It wasn't until 1582 that an attempt was made to stage it, but this came to nothing and again the script languished in the Cardinal's library. Fast forward to 1588 and the Cardinal has relinquished his church offices and become Grand Duke Ferdinand I. He is preparing to marry Princess Christine of Lorraine and issues a request for playwrights to submit works suitable for the celebrations. Bargagli and Piccolomini were both dead by now and Zazzini in exile, but Bargagli's younger brother Scipioni submitted the play for consideration. Quite how he had a copy isn't clear, nor why it was selected. Perhaps the Cardinal, now the Grand Duke, remembered it and had always liked it. Scipioni was asked to modernise the play and remove the anti-clerical jokes that Sozzini had inserted, and it was presented for the bride and groom's guests after the wedding in 1589. The performance was given at the recently completed and lavishly decorated theatre in the Medici Palace, and accompanied by several musical intermezzi composed and performed by the finest musicians in the city. There was comment at the time that the beauty of the musical interludes was so great that they overshadowed the play itself. That they were given prominence is evidenced by the fact that La Pellegrina has no prologue, which is almost unique in the history of Italian Renaissance comedy. 
It speculated that the prologue was removed because space had to be found to accommodate the six intermezzi. Whatever the quality of the music was, this is to the detriment of the play. Without an introduction, much of the opening scene is by necessity taken up with some overlong and clumsy exposition where characters tell each other things that they must already be well aware of but are essential for the audience understanding of quite a complex premise. The play was well received by the privileged guests who saw it and in the second week of the celebrations for the wedding a repeat performance was given for the benefit of the Venetian ambassador and his entourage whose arrival had been delayed. The script and the score were published soon after but as far as I can ascertain, the play had no life in performance beyond the nuptial production. Here is a summary of the plot that the wedding guests enjoyed. Cassandro is an elderly resident of Pisa. Anxious to marry his daughter, Lepida, off to a good family, he arranges for her betrothal to Lucrezio. She has a problem with this, as she is already secretly married to Terenzio, who is living in the family home pretending to be her tutor. This deception has been very successful so far, so much so that Lepida is pregnant. She sees the need to delay the now imminent wedding, so she feigns madness. Her father wants to call on doctors and other experts to rid her of the evil spirits that have obviously possessed her, and quickly, so the word of her state doesn't get out and affect his good standing. Lepida realises that she will never be able to fool a doctor, and asks her quick-thinking maid Giglietta to help her find a resolution to this situation. Meanwhile, her lover, the disguised tutor, worries about his future. He is far away from home, having been abducted and enslaved by Turkish brigands. For many years he was held captive before he was able to escape and then slowly travel back across Europe, back to Austria, in the hope of being reunited with his family. The journey was interrupted when, while he was resting in Pisa, he caught sight of Lepida and instantly fell in love with her. He disguised himself as a pedant and wooed her successfully. Their wedding was witnessed only by Giglietta the maid, but he has now written to his father asking for his retrospective assent to the marriage, and he's anxiously awaiting his reply. In the meantime, Lepida has agreed not to reveal details of their semi-legitimate union to anyone. Lucrezio, however, is having second thoughts about the proposed wedding, having heard rumours of Lepida's mental instability. Cassandro tries to assure him that this is just a temporary attack of nerves at the approaching nuptials but Lucrezio's reluctance has another cause. He is filled with guilt about a previous relationship. While on a business trip to Spain, he had pledged his love to Drusilla, and she had reciprocated his feelings. They were secretly married for reasons that he dismisses as too complicated to explain. Their union was never consummated, with Drusilla insisting that they wait until their true position could be made public. They exchanged a single kiss as a pledge of their love. Fate is not kind to them, though, and just a day later, Lucrezio is called to Italy by his employers. He left, giving Drusilla his word that he would return within a year. When he arrived in Pisa, he found that his affairs had gone terribly wrong. His business associates had gone bankrupt and one of them had died, and it took him a two full years to rearrange matters and get the business back on its feet. Then his friend Fabrizio arrives with terrible news. Drusilla was dead. Fabrizio is sure of this because he had seen her body being carried for burial. Lucrezio assumes that she died from humiliation and grief, believing that he had abandoned her thanks to his delayed return. The fault is all his and he cannot find a way to forgive himself. It is only thanks to the persistent urging by his family that he is now contemplating marriage to Cassandro's daughter. Showing his materialistic side, he acknowledges though that this union will bring him some commercial benefits. Drusilla, of course, is not dead. Certain that she had been abandoned by Lucrezio, she had become so despondent that for several hours she had fallen into a catatonic state and had been taken for dead. It was only at the last moment, as her grave was being prepared, that she had revived. Over the following weeks she was slowly restored to health and her resolve strengthened. Determined to find Lucrezio, who she still loved dearly, She disguised herself as a pilgrim, saying that she had to fulfil a vow made when she was in the midst of her near-fatal illness, and set out for Italy to learn the truth. Accompanying her as chaperones and protectors were the elderly Ricardo, a lifetime family friend, and the rather sickly Madame Tomasa. Arriving in Pisa and taking in all its glories, the travellers take lodgings in the house belonging to Violante. They don't know it, but she is a procuress. 
Drusilla searches the town for word of Lucrezio and eventually learns about his betrothal and impending wedding, but also hears that all is not well with the preparations as there are rumours about the state of the bride's health. She is determined to meet Lucrezio and Lepida in person and arranges for Violante to spread a rumour about the arrival of a Spanish pilgrim who can work miraculous cures. Violante is only too happy to oblige, hoping that this will draw in potential gullible customers for her. Cassandro gets to hear of the Spanish pilgrim's abilities and decides that Lepida has to see her. At the same time, hearing that the pilgrim is from Spain, Lucrezio also asks to meet her, believing that she might be able to tell him something more about Drusilla's sad end. He also wants to discuss Lupita's strange illness with her, thinking that it may give him an opportunity to break the marriage contract without any loss of honour. Federigo, also a student from Austria, makes his entrance. He is in love with Lupita and is bribing Cassandro's less than trustworthy servant Targetta to keep him updated on her condition. In the next scene, Lucrezio meets with the pilgrim, who keeps her face in the shadows so he doesn't recognise her. Although Drusilla is happy to hear that he is unwilling to be married to Lepida, especially if she cannot be cured of her madness, she is disappointed that he makes no mention of any earlier, more meaningful relationships, despite some quite obvious prompting. She offers some advice. Do not wed. Lepida's pregnancy will soon become obvious, and Giglietta advises her to marry Lucrezio quickly, but then to resume her relationship with Terenzio, her true love. But Lepida is virtuous and loyal to love and cannot accept this deceitful course of action. She resolves to continue with her performance of madness. Federico, the Austrian student, returns to be assured by Targetta that Lepida is as sane as anyone else and happy to receive his gifts and letters. He's happy to hear this, but in fact Targetta has been pocketing the gifts for himself and has never delivered a single letter to his master's daughter. Emboldened by his assurances, he resolves to break into Lepida's bedroom that night and relieve her of her maidenhood, something he's convinced that she will be only too pleased to give up to him. Targetta, showing every inch of his mercenary nature, agrees to help with this plan. Following in a long tradition of theatrical plots, the large hand of coincidence now comes out to play. Giglietta and Violante are revealed to be good friends, happy to help each other out. Federico happens to be boarding at Violante's establishment. Drusilla, still disguised as the pilgrim with healing powers, attends on Lepida at the request of her father and her father's husband. Lepida believes that she is in the presence of a holy person and confesses all, throwing herself on Drusilla's mercy. Touched by her story, Drusilla agrees to help her. She recommends the cure for madness to be a herbal bath, the ingredients for which are rare and need to be freshly gathered. Her plan is that even after the bath, Lepida should continue her madness act and thereby prove that her state is incurable, knowing that Lucrezio will then be able to refuse her. Little do they know that Targetta has been listening in on this conversation and now knows that the madness is a ruse, but he misunderstands the situation and believes that Lucrezio is the father of Lepida's child. Hoping that such information will earn him some nice extra income, he hurries off to find Cassandro. When he hears this incredible news, he can only think that Lucrezio is trying to get the marriage settlement increased. Unsure what to do next, but thinking about his purse, he sends Targetta to the pilgrim to cancel the herbal bath before any further expense is wasted on it. Targetta spins the story to Drusella so that she believes Lucrezio is indeed party to an extortion scheme, once again proving him to be a heartless fortune seeker and not the man that she thought she had fallen in love with. Still in a rage, Cassandro seeks out Lucrezio and they meet on the street. He berates the unsuspecting young man for the ill-treatment of his daughter and his despicable schemes that have now been revealed. At first, Lucrezio cannot even grasp his meaning, but once he realises the nature of the accusations, he angrily denies them and both men storm off stage in opposite directions. Targetta continues his scheming by telling Drusilla of Lucrezio's behaviour, seemingly confirming just what a bad character he is. Drusilla is caught in a mixture of anger and despair. As Targetta tries to calm her, he remembers Federico and his plan to accost Lepida in her bedroom and leaves to try to stop the attack. But he's too late. Federico has already made it through an open back door into the house and climbed into Lepida's bedroom. To his horror, he catches her already in bed with Terenzio. 
He is insulted, unable to comprehend how Lapida could possibly prefer the attentions of a lowly tutor to his own. He convinces himself that the honourable thing to do is to inform Cassandro about his wayward daughter and the untrustworthy employee in his household. When they meet, at first Cassandro cannot believe what he is being told, but when Federico selflessly agrees to accompany him, he agrees that he needs to find out the truth. By the house, Drusilla has become overwhelmed by her emotions and has again fallen into a catatonic state. Everyone is concerned for her, but events inside the house take Cassandro and Federico inside, where they find Lapida and Terenzio still in bed. They grab the tutor and debate what is to be done with him. Federico suggests throwing him in the River Arno in a sack where he would surely drown. But Cassandro is fearful that such a plot would eventually be discovered and resolves that he must be handed over to the prince of the state, a just and kind ruler, for criminal judgment, despite the scandal that this would undoubtedly cause. In the meantime, Drusilla has recovered and seeks out Lucrezio, determined to face him one last time. But then she sees Terenzio being held by the police, who are explaining to Cassandro that if convicted, Terenzio would face 20 years as a galley slave. As he continues to protest his innocence, Federico, consumed with jealousy, throws out even more bizarre accusations against him. Cassandro resolves to force his daughter into a nunnery. In an attempt to establish his credentials, Terenzio tells the story of his noble birth in Austria and the details of how he was abducted and used as a slave until he escaped. With a shocked gasp, Federico recognises Terenzo as his long-lost brother, stolen from his family by marauding Turks. His attitude to Terenzio immediately changes and he pleads to Cassandro for his brother's release and forgiveness. On his knees, Federico reminds Cassandro that his daughter and Federico's brother only did what they did out of true and pure love for each other. Drusilla steps in and adds her own voice to the argument by saying that man is closest to God when he forgives. And after some further debate, Cassandro is moved to agree to a proper wedding ceremony for the couple and a suitable dowry. As all is settled, Lucrezio and Drusilla meet in the gathered crowd. She is still in her pilgrim's disguise, but as they discuss the events of the play, they slowly resolve their own misunderstandings and, at length, she throws off her pilgrim's robe and hood and they are reunited in a moment of mutual forgiveness and love. So, there is a lot that we can recognise in this. Although it's the only example of this playwright's work and owes some of its themes and concerns to its Sienese origins, it is very typical of an Italian Renaissance comedy. As I'm sure you were thinking while listening to the details of the plot, the roots of the play, like so many others from the period, clearly stretch back to Roman and even Greek theatre. The sly servants, who are on the make and always looking for a way to outsmart their masters, are the direct inheritors of the cunning slave from Greek and Roman comedy. They're toned down from these originals and lack their hard edge and malicious intent, but are recognisable as the stock character. Coincidence as the descendant of the fate of the gods is used as a major plot tool, just as it was by Sophocles, Menander and the rest. The sex comedy element, particularly the audience laughing at the frustrations of the young men, follows a similar line back to Lysistrata and, no doubt, other lost Greek comedies. There are many other examples across the plot and character types, but the play is also from a period where these influences were being superseded by new ideas for the theatre and different sensibilities. Perhaps what stands out most as uniquely present in the Renaissance comedy is the fact that it is drenched in sentimentality. We don't see this in ancient Greek theatre, where I can't help thinking that sentimentality would have been seen as an unwelcome human failing, and it's also lacking in Roman theatre. Now that may be because we don't have much evidence of the content of Roman mime and pantomime. The Romans were certainly open to a bit of sentimentality at times, but it's not evidenced over much in the theatre. However, Renaissance Italians loved it. The example that stands out here is the final reveal scene between Drusilla and Lucrezio. I summarised it in a few lines, but it is in fact pages of dialogue that cries out in my view for some serious editing. But there must have been a point here. By the late part of the 16th century, Renaissance comedy had moved on from its origins and had become much more concerned with the emotional response of characters to events rather than the comic mechanics of the events themselves. The implications of the events in the play are romantic, but also have the potential for tragedy. 
In this context, the comedy becomes subdued and the theme a serious one. So we lose the more grotesque elements of previous comedies and gain something that we can't exactly call subtle, as what it is is quite overstated to the modern ear. And we have to remember that this is not just about the fashions of the day. Those fashions do play a part. But specifically for this play, it was written and then rewritten for a wedding celebration. So the purity of true love has to be seen as becoming triumphant over material concerns and carnal desires. That's all quite appropriate for the performance setting, as, we could argue, is the tendency towards sentimentality. Even outside those circumstances, popular taste, at least in the courtly setting, enjoyed the sentimental, but also still enjoyed the element of sex comedy, which in this case is quite prominent. This is where La Pellegrina shows its place of origin. The continued liking for the mix of bawdy comedy with satirical elements contained within a sentimental comedy came most prominently out of Siena and then spread through Italy until it became part of the character of Commedia dell'arte and then melodrama and tragicomic plays that became so popular in the Baroque period. Why this happened particularly in Siena is difficult to say. The city-state was constantly trying to find its place somewhere between the influences of the Medici, Florence and Venice, and somewhere in that mix, the local playwrights found a voice that, at this time, was a bit braver and a bit more outspoken and more inclined to a sense of the tragic within comedy than those working in the neighbouring states. In the play, the fortunes of the main characters follow a strong arc, and that helps the audience through the complexities of the plot. It takes the characters to a very low point, which is then reversed towards the end of the play. But all of this is not driven by a central deceit or trick performed by a lower character, as in ancient Roman and in some current Florentine comedy. In this case, the lower characters don't become central to the plot, because that plot is being driven by the love between the central characters. Even Lapida's feigned madness, the only deception that is intentional and central to the plot, is created because of her true love for Terenzio, and because the motives are pure, forgiveness in the face of God is possible. The minor characters may not participate in driving the plot, but they are essential to the comedy of the play, such as it is. Their commentary on the actions of the other characters is filled with the pithy language of the streets, which at times is positively scatological and caustic comments on the nature of society in Siena. The servant characters complain about the severity of the chores they have to perform, their low wages and generally unfair treatment. The clergy are taken to task for their profligate lifestyle while forever asking their parishioners for charity. In one scene, Lapida is examined to see if an exorcism is required to cure her. She is surrounded by young seminarians whose descriptions of her flesh are positively lecherous and this after the worst of the criticism of the clergy had been removed from the original version. In fact, these criticisms and the language featured in the play are so strong that some have suggested that the printed script must have been further censored for performance to avoid censure from the ex-cardinal, the Grand Duke. Perhaps trying to aim his commentary at the higher end of society, the legal profession is also in the firing line, even though the play's author was one of their ranks. Cassandro bemoans the costs of taking legal advice and the inevitable delays as he would have to work his way through the ranks of junior lawyers before he would get any decent advice. And then we get a debate between the foreign brothers Federico and Terenzio about how language should be used, the vernacular Italian versus Latin argument, which leads to commentary on the debate on the value and influence of Petrarch in Italian literature that was current at the time. It's already noted the authors were erudite scholars and members of the local academia, so some of this is to show off their knowledge and to appeal to their fellow academicians. But presumably, they expected this to be not completely lost on their general audience. Perhaps, had the play had an afterlife and more general performances, some of the more academic references would have been updated or removed altogether. Another difficulty with the play is the role of women in it. We know that ladies made up a significant portion of the theatre audience at the time and certainly would have been present at the wedding celebrations. As we've seen, playwrights like Piccolomini were sensitive to their needs. But here, as characters in the play, they display double standards at least and much of the commentary on them by the male characters is very unkind. When Lucrezio protests that he should not be expected to put up with a mad wife, his servant suggests that there is no chance of finding any woman who's not a bit soft in the head. 
Later, the same character suggests that he is unlikely to ever find a woman who's not devilish, and that isn't even counting those who are as ugly as to look like devils. It sounds very cruel, even misogynistic, but it's possible that Bargalgi intended to tease his female audience, and they were less likely to take offence than we might imagine. Drusilla and Lepida are both moral in their own worlds, the former being promised to a man only with a chaste kiss, and the latter following true love and is married despite not having Cassandra's consent. They are rewarded with a happy ending, where the lower, less moral characters, while not punished, are to be laughed at. Violante, the ageing bored, is perhaps the most amusing, as she longs to still be working as a prostitute and cannot understand why her overtures to young men are being turned down so firmly. Foreigners also take a bashing, as an easy target for the authors, although they had the sense to avoid saying anything bad about France, the bride's homeland. The bawdy humour does not seem to take into account any idea that this might be an inappropriate for the wedding setting. In one scene, Violante and Giglietta discuss the merits of their different lovers, in the former's case, her customers. While listing male prowess by profession, she says that students were always disappointing despite the enthusiasm of youth except for one year-long relationship where the young man in question never made love to her twice in the same way, something that she says could only come from studying the subject in books most diligently. Everything she knows, she admits, she learnt from him. And this is not the most explicit discussion of the act of sex in the play, but it is typical of the level and flavour of the comedy, much of which is contained within long soliloquies or asides to the audience, which try to be conspiratorial in tone, but it's difficult to imagine that the audience felt much connection or camaraderie with these lower characters. There are many points that make this play an uneven one. The plot is overcomplicated and includes several subplots that don't achieve much. Some characters can speak coarsely in one scene for comic effect, but be the mouthpiece for the erudite argument of the academicians in another. What was apparently some of the most sublime music written for the time is said to have overshadowed the play itself. This may be the result of the play being reworked and repurposed by at least four hands. Creativity by committee has a largely ignominious history. However, for all this criticism, there is a but, and it's a big one. The play was only performed once, but was printed shortly after and remained in print for six reprints. It was widely read throughout Italy and France and became the model for many plays in those countries for the next century, up to and including some of the works by Molière. Its longest lasting legacy was as, if not an initiator, then certainly the most popular example of what was to become known as Commedia Grava. That type of comedy was expertly described by translator Bruno Faro as a comedy of sentiment and manners in which scenes dealing with love, honour, faith, loyalty and obedience testify to the theatrical taste of the times and to a morality which could exist only in a period of religious and political stability. Which we can agree is broadly true, although the concept of morality seems to have had some very flexible borders at the time. If you're interested to read the play in full, it's just about available still in an English translation by Bruno Faro, and his introduction, from which I've gleaned much of the information in this episode, gives a very detailed and interesting summary of the period. This is by no means the end of the story of Italian influence on theatre in the Renaissance period, but next time I'm going to switch the focus north and take a look at what was going on in the Germanic states, where, along with much else, theatre had to survive within the context of religious reformation, and the troubled times that that brought about. In the meantime, do you have a spare moment to give me a review and rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps to get podcasts noticed, so it would be great to get a few more up there. But of course, the best type of review is word of mouth recommendation, so please do share the podcast far and wide, wherever you think it might be appreciated. For the supporters on Patreon, there is another new episode on Henslow's Diary, this time looking at the plays produced at the Rose Playhouse in July 1596, a month that opened with a paradox and closed with dramatic events off stage. You can hear that and much more if you sign up for a small monthly fee at www.patreon.com slash thoetp. I look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. Mm-hmm.